Hello everyone and a warm welcome back to our Evolution and Ecology seminar series. My name is Elizabeth Duxbury and I'm a postdoc in the research group of Alexei Maklikov at the University of East Anglia and I'll be hosting today's session. Myself and our wonderful team of co-organisers, Andreas, Ulia and Wouter, are very grateful for the enthusiasm from the research community for these seminars and it has been a pleasure to host such a variety of great minds so far. So thank you all for your fantastic engagement in the series. Before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to remind you that there will be a Q&A session directly after this talk. So please post your questions in the dedicated Slack channel and upvote questions that you'd like to hear. And with that, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Paul Turner, the Rachel Carson Professor of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Yale University in the USA. Paul's research explores the evolutionary genetics and ecology of host microbe interactions with a particular focus on the ability of viruses to adapt to changes in their biotic and abiotic environments, and even how mutualism can evolve from parasitism. Paul and his research group take an interdisciplinary approach to address questions related to virus emergence by combining experimental evolution with microbiology, genomics, and modeling approaches. Equally fascinatingly, Paul's research has an exciting applied angle using evolutionary principles to develop new virus-based phage therapies to target antibiotic-resistant bacteria and attack cancer cells. Paul is a committed advocate for diversity in STEM and in recognition of his research excellence. Last year, Paul was elected as a fellow of the National Academy of Sciences the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the American Academy of Microbiology. <laughs> Today, Paul will present his talk entitled Leverage in Evolutionary Trade-Offs and Phage Selection Pressure to Reduce Bacterial Pathogenicity. So, Paul, thank you for accepting our invitation, and over to you. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I hope that my volume is okay. Uh, but, hey, it's a tremendous pleasure to be uh, invited to this. I think you're, I, we were saying in the lead up before everybody joined us, uh, this has just been so valuable, I think, for the research community, the scientific community to benefit from these virtual seminar series. So thank you very much for the introduction, Elizabeth, and thank you to all of you for inviting me. All right. So uh, what I hope to do is speak for roughly 45 minutes, allowing plenty of time for questions. So we'll see if I can adhere to my time, self-imposed time limits. Uh, this Beginning slide it gives away the punchline of a lot of what we're doing in this one project that I'll spend most of my lecture talking about. And on the left, we begin with uh, an individual who's been working with me for some time at Yale as a research scientist. This is Ben Chan. He's sampling water from nature that ultimately these types of samples can yield bacteriophages. Uh, phages are the most plentiful biological entities on the planet. It's very easy to find them in water, soil, and other natural locations. But the question is, beyond the amazing research that one can do to understand the biodiversity and biology of phages, what can you use phages for? Well, there's a very old idea that is still popular and gaining in popularity, and that is using phages as therapies. And I'll talk about that to a pretty great extent. But here on the right, the far right, is an example of what is possible. So here's Ben Chan again. He's in a hospital room showing a vial of phages to a young woman who is suffering from a chronic bacterial infection that is multidrug resistant in her lungs. And the idea is that she would breathe in these phages as an alternative to chemical antibiotics because chemo chemical antibiotics are not able to treat her infection. Looking on is her pediatric cystic fibrosis doctor, and I'll talk more about such patients and how phage therapy can benefit them. So there's a lot of promise to this technology, and I would also add, and this is a big focus of what I'll talk about today, is understanding evolution thinking and ecological thinking improves our ability to do such therapies, and there is a ton of basic research that needs to be occurring in the system, even though we have had some early successes. A couple of slides, a little more generally on my background, and Elizabeth did allude to this, so I won't talk about it at length, but what I've always been interested in are microbes and how they can deal with environmental changes. A lot of this has occurred in virus systems, but uh, this slide illustrates the very many ways at different biological levels that viruses face changing environments. Uh, 
So the virus must interact with the cell in order to initiate replication eventually in that cell and have particles exit. So at the level of molecular and cell biology, this protein-protein binding and recognition of viruses to cell surfaces and how they can uh, initiate infection is something that can change on viruses over time. In tissue biology, multicellular organisms like us, we have tissues that have heterogeneity within them, or we have the ability for a virus to move between tissue types, and that's not such an easy thing to navigate. And that poses a different kind of environmental change and pressure on virus populations to keep up with that possibility. Of course, immune systems are both innate and adaptive, and uh, this is a way that host biology, everything from bacteria to other myriad life, cellular life forms, have forms of defenses that prevent virus attack. So the ability to keep up with that is a huge challenge to viruses. Vector biology, I'm fascinated by the ability of this very distant cousin of yours to transmit viruses between humans and other individual mammals. And the point is within the midget of this mosquito, there's plenty of virus replication for vector-borne, arthropod-borne viruses. And that's a challenge to them to navigate uh, growing in two very different environments. And last, I would say that climate change and global level changes in the biosphere are felt by all biological entities, including the smallest uh, forms of life and microbes on this planet. So that's something of interest to me and my group. How we tackle these questions, uh, it's a wide range of study systems and what I would say is a continuum that ranges from basic to applied. So on the left, a lot of my early training and to date, considered just basic questions in evolutionary biology, the tempo and mode of evolutionary change. Increasingly, we're interested in evolutionary contingency. How is it that some lineages can evolve successfully through time, whereas other lineages have slower rates of adaptation or fail to adapt at all? And uh, we have increasing ability to use tools to look within evolving populations, for example, in the laboratory, to uh, document how allele changes occur over time. And this is just an example from some of our published work down here on the left. More in the middle I, ground of this continuum are similar kinds of experiments and approaches, but focused a bit more on the ecology and evolution of infectious disease. So we've had work that looks, for example, at in a particular country and the northern and southern parts of Vietnam. How is it that dengue viruses that are isolated there in clinic and also mosquito populations that exist in the north and the south under relatively different temperature regimes, how do they function in relative to one another in a G by E way? So we've had work done on that. Conceptually, through theory as well as experiments, we're quite interested in the parasitism neutralism continuum, as Elizabeth mentioned at the outset. And is it possible for microbes, especially viruses, to evolve to be more mutualistic or more parasitic? And does this lock them in? Uh, is there a possibility to move across that continuum further? A lot of what I'll talk about today is improved and novel applications using viruses. So uh, that's the bulk of my talk. And here's the overarching problem that we're dealing with, the antibiotic resistance crisis. There are many ways to document this and convince you, but you're a very literate audience. I'm sure you already know that antibiotics are unfortunately failing. So the upper right here is a projection map of only a couple of decades from now what will the situation be? And it is a sobering prediction that there will be millions of people, especially in the most populated parts of the world, that will die annually from uh, antimicrobial resistant infections. And a lot of this is occurring in bacteria that are opportunistic pathogens of humans. And when they get in, it's impossible to now fight many of these bacteria with chemical antibiotics. And that problem is only getting worse. Unfortunately, solutions aren't really coming that much from big pharma. Uh, through time, this is a timeline of up until the 80s and 90s, there, were, there was a lot of work in discovering new antibiotics, bringing them ultimately to market, and that's not such a lucrative exercise anymore because there's uh, the ability to do this and it costs millions if not billions of dollars, and then those drugs are placed on a shelf as a last resort, and therefore they don't really get prescribed that often, they don't get sold that often, and big pharma is not interested in this because they have to stay alive through commercial profit. So this is a big deal. What are you going to do about it? So there is an old idea that predates the discovery of chemical antibiotics, and this would be the use of lytic phages uh, as viruses that will kill only susceptible bacteria, and especially bacterial pathogens. So here on the left, if you're not familiar with a lytic phage reproduction cycle, uh, this illustrates how this could be an alternative to chemical antibiotic drugs. A phage can interact with the bacterial target, 
take over the molecular machinery, make copies, and those are eventually released through this process of lysis, and they can go on and infect similar cell types. So this work, uh, soon after the discovery of bacteriophages, and here's one of the co-discoverers, this is Felix Durrell, and he co-discovered phages in 1917. He had only one faculty appointment in his career. It happened to be at my institution, Yale University, way back in the day here in the uh, late 1920s, early 1930s. But he was also instrumental in helping establish institutes and research programs in other parts of the world uh, early on when folks were trying phage therapy in animals and in humans. So he helped the Eliava Institute with its early work, and they still exist in TBLC, Georgia, the country of Georgia. Uh, if you want to learn more about Felix Durrell, there was a great book written by one of my emeritus colleagues at Yale University, Bill Summers. Uh, just yesterday, Steve Stearns, one of my colleagues, mentioned to me that I believe in this book, it's mentioned that, that um, Felix Durrell taught the first phage course in the United States, the first course dealing with bacteriophages, and that was quite a long time ago. It was early in his career, but uh, I did not know that until yesterday. So what are the benefits and costs of phage therapy? The benefits, I think, are pretty obvious. The specificity of the drug, if you will, the phage to its target, is something that is very useful, potentially. So we know that broad-spectrum antibiotics can do a lot of damage to native microbiomes and in the human body. So that's not so good, and this is a more uh, specific approach. The self-amplification, this is a drug that makes copies of itself, and that's extremely efficient from minimal dosing, for example. So what are the costs? The specificity could give you limited spectrum. If I had to find the right phage genotype to match the right genotype of an infecting bacterial pathogen, that would be a very tedious exercise. So what I and others are doing is examining whether there is some generality to this that can be really leveraged moving forward in phage therapy. The delivery to the infection site could be problematic, depending where the infection site is in the human body or some other creature. Uh, today, I'll talk mostly about delivery to the human lung, which is easy through inhalation, uh, through nebulizers, but other sites might be more difficult. Immune recognition is a terrifically important thing to consider. You almost assuredly will encounter bacteriophages at some point today. In your food, your water, uh, just sitting in a room, breathing air in with phages, phage particles attached to dust particles. So this is something that you see and you don't generally mount a big immune response, but the question is if I give you 10 to the 10 or 10 to the 11 phages per day for a week or 10 days, is that gonna be a different situation and your immune system will catch on to that drug. But where we really come in to this uh, in trying to examine phage therapy and how it could be updated is through the recognition that bacteria evolve resistance to drugs. And that's why we have the antibiotic resistance crisis. So they should also evolve resistance to phages. And there are very many mechanisms that we know of this in the microbial world. So how do you take that, um, that cost and actually turn it into a benefit? And our focus has been evolutionary trade-offs. I've studied these in my career. It's quite obvious that evolution involves compromises. So selection takes populations down one path or more than one path, but traits are improved, and this could occur at the expense of reduced performance in other traits. So one way to talk about this and illustrate it could be humans relative to our close relatives in the great apes, chimpanzees. So one of the things that humans do better, as far as I know, than any other creature is to throw objects with high velocity and accuracy. And chimps, they can throw objects as well, but they can't throw them as fast or as accurately as a human can. And likewise, we don't have the upper musculature in our bodies to climb trees and hang very comfortably from one arm as we're climbing uh, a tree as a, this young chimp is showing. So the point is we do many things well as our species of great ape and chimpanzees do other things better than us, vice versa. One liability of being um, upright, walking, great ape, is all the time you spend on your two feet gives you vulnerability to lower back pain and neck pain. So this is a great example of how humans are uh, not even close to the pinnacle of evolution as some people would like to think that there's a lot of liabilities that come along with certain traits that we've evolved. So we tried to take this idea to phage therapy and renew the approach. So can we select, can we use this evolutionary trade-off approach to our advantage? So this could be thought of as an innovation where if you find certain traits in bacterial populations and phages that will interact with those uh, traits in a pathogen, 
could you kill the pathogens while also exerting selection pressure on them to change to deal with the phage problem and as a result undergo a trade-off that makes them more vulnerable to ordinary biomedical approaches. So this would be a synergistic innovation and it's illustrated in this cartoon here from a recent review article that we wrote. So imagine this phage that's color-coded in red for this bacterial cell, it could be interacting with the outermost protein of what are called efflux pumps. These complexes of proteins that do lots of things functionally in bacteria, but one thing that they unfortunately do in the eyes of biomedicine is if antibiotics get into the cell, some pathogens that are bacteria can just pump those antibiotics right back out. And that allows them to gain resistance across a lot of antibiotic classes, and it contributes to the multi-drug antibiotic resistance crisis. So the point is if you use a phage therapy approach, then you can deploy your phage and kill those bacteria. And we would like to be able to predict then that the bacteria are gonna follow a evolutionary path to deal with the evolution of phage resistance and they would compromise the functionality of these efflux pumps. Well, guess what comes along with that? The inability to move those antibiotics out of the cell and you're switching a system from antibiotic resistance to one that is antibiotic sensitive when you use this phage approach. So not only does the phage kill, but it changes the system to be less dangerous, less pathogenic. I'll go faster through this example of uh, a capsule that could be surrounding the entire cell, shielding it from recognition by the immune system. A phage that's interacting with that capsule can bind, enter, and kill, and exert selection pressure on the bacterial population to shed or alter that capsule, making it more vulnerable to immune system recognition. So we've got here a quick example of toggling antibiotic resistance as well as toggling high virulence to change them to antibiotic sensitivity or to low virulence. So uh, I would assert, and this is what we assumed going into this research, is that one could engineer phages to do this work. Or you could take advantage of the vast biodiversity that has evolved for phages on this planet. And you might be able to find phages that naturally interact with these virulence factors and antibiotic resistance mechanisms as shown in this hypothetical cartoon. If you've got this bacterial cell and depending on what kind of pathogen it is, maybe porins, efflux pumps, pili, flagella are more important for the pathogenicity, um, could be something that's incredibly plentiful around the bacterial cell like lipopolysaccharide, which provides structure to the cell, but is also a potential recognition point for phage uh, binding and entry. So, our contention is that you should be able to find these phages in nature because they've evolved naturally to interact with these types of bacterial features. And uh, that's exactly what we've been spending a lot of time and energy doing in the last few years. So where you can find phages is pretty much everywhere. You can look in very pristine environments like this small lake in Connecticut called Dodge Pond. You could look in less pristine environments such as Ben here is sampling, he's doing phage hunting along the coastline in Haiti in an obviously um, quite littered zone here that is uh, unfortunate for that circumstance, but the contamination in this area might lend itself to a lot of phages that are able to infect bacterial pathogens of humans. Similarly here, uh, uh, a river near dwellings in Democratic Republic of Congo. But of course there's the standard approach of going to wastewater treatment plants where it's very easy to do phage hunting. And also one might look in agricultural systems, which a reminder, a lot of antibiotics are used in animal feed to make more meat per animal. And this I think would be a good setting for antibiotic resistant bacteria and maybe phages that are able to exploit those bacteria to uh, replicate. And one can look there for phage hunting. So I, I forgot to mention a moment ago that basically I'm gonna take you through a bit of a pipeline of what we experience from the front end of finding phages in nature, characterizing them, trusting them to be able to be placed in patients through emergency patient therapy or personalized medicine. And then ultimately, uh, we would like to gain enough confidence that we could launch a clinical trial that would develop a phage or phages to tackle a particular antibiotic resistance or virulence targeting problem in bacteria. So I'll take you through that pipeline as quickly as I can. A next step would be if you're finding phages in nature, Sequencing is more and more affordable every day. And I think genome sequencing is something that goes nicely hand in hand because it is affordable with phage discovery. And you can immediately benefit from it by, in this case, um, this happens to be a diagram for a phage hunting exercise and genomics applied for phages that can attack Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And the data set comes from 
a company that I co-founded, Felix Biotechnology, where our goal is to try and develop phage therapy. And here, early in the pipeline, we would like to take phage isolates and place them into different known families of phages. So this not only contributes to the understanding and diversity of phages on the planet, but for example, one can do the sequencing and if you see hallmarks of genes that do not coincide with strictly lytic replication in phages, it might be useful to take those phages and remove them from consideration in phage therapy. And why is that? So the other way that phages can replicate, the other major way is a temperate or a lysogenic life cycle where they can undergo lysis and kill cells, but they can also kind of remain quiet in the cytoplasm or nested within the bacterial chromosome and each daughter cell will inherit a copy of the phage without dying from the phage infection. So that doesn't necessarily remove those phages from use in therapy, but it certainly complicates because you don't always get the killing of the target bacteria that you're trying to go after. So the point is the genome sequencing can tell you a lot aside from assigning them to families. It can also tell you genes that you want to avoid, toxin genes, uh, genes for this lysogeny life cycle, et cetera. Okay, now what I'm gonna do with this next set of slides is start with this first slide and then zoom out from it. Uh, what we would like to know is generality. I mentioned this earlier. So if you find some phage and you think it might be a good candidate for phage therapy, in this case, we're doing what a lot of people do. We're taking that phage and we're challenging it, in this one example, to grow on a large number of Pseudomonas originosa isolates that come from the clinic. So CF patients, those with cystic fibrosis, often face Pseudomonas originosa infections that can cause them a lot of harm. And there are huge collections of these bacteria that are available. So we, in this case, are taking this phage and challenging it to see, does it have high specificity, only able to infect a couple of those genotypes, or is it very successful? So the dark filled in cells here in this diagram show you that for this one phage, it's actually pretty good at covering a lot of this genotype space in the target bacteria. And we do whole genome sequencing on the target bacteria, understanding their relatedness to one another. And we would like to take that information and help us understand why this phage is able to infect some bacteria and not others. I won't get into that too much today. I'm happy to talk about it more in the Q&A. So as we zoom out, it's a reminder that one could do this work for not just one phage isolate. Here we've got several phages that are closely related to one another, and they're all candidate phages, and you're seeing very different patterns for their ability to infect these challenge strains. And if you zoom way out, it's illustrating what a lot of people who do this work, uh, what they're busily doing. They are looking across challenge bacteria and very large libraries of phages to see what kind of hits do you get. And uh, what you can see is a lot of dark blue in this diagram, and I think this illustrates nicely that there is an assumption that phages might be too specific to be useful, and I think that that's an assumption that's quickly being challenged and in some cases overturned, that you can find phages naturally occurring that uh, are able to cover broad genotype space. So then what comes next? How are you going to deploy these in phage therapy? Do you want to bundle together many of these uh, phages that are seen as more specialized, or do you want to find as many generalized phages as possible and bundle them together? Um, or do you even have to create a cocktail at all? If you have a very general killer, it might be useful if it is prescribed widely as a phage that would help individuals suffering with bacterial infections of a particular type. So I think that there are a lot of assumptions that are being used in phage therapy. Um, it's a reminder that there's a lot of basic research that can very uh, nicely challenge those assumptions and see what other strategies might be useful. Individual phages deployed, maybe phages in sequence or bundling to them together. We tend to favor uh, individual phages being deployed or deploying them in sequence, but I'm happy to talk more about that later. Okay, so we've gotten through phage discovery, genome sequencing, measuring host range, but really to get at this heart of the matter of exerting uh, selection pressure for a trade-off, you have to know what the phage is binding to. And this is actually not that easy to figure out. Historically, it is the case that some phages that are very well studied, we understand explicitly how they attach to cells. But if you take a phage from nature and you want to know what it's binding to, you have to do a fair bit of work to figure this out. One paper that we published earlier this year for a technique that we think should be useful 
harnesses transposon mutant libraries and a target bacterium. So in-seq is this approach. And you can have these single insertion transposons create a library of bacterial mutants where individual genes are being disrupted for their ability to function. And if you put them through phage selection, you will get enrichment for the mutants in that library that are phage resistant. So in a moment, I'll show you the output of what these data look like. I refer you to this paper, uh, Court Wright et al. from earlier this year, if you wanna look at the details. But in the diagrams I'll show you, it's up here in the upper left. When you look for genes for phage infection, those are going to be your hits. And the question is how uh, statistically significant are those hits to give us an immediate idea of what a phage is binding to because the gene has been disrupted and therefore the bacteria are resistant to the phage because that's missing for that phage in the binding process. A control is a great thing to include in any experiment and we use several controls in this study. Phage T6 is well characterized. It is known to bind to the TSX porin of E. coli bacteria. So in this output from our study, the screaming high statistically significant hit here for TSX makes complete sense. Here for a novel phage that we pretty much only knew it was lytic and could infect E. coli, we put it through the same screening process. It just so happens that it uses TSX as a porin as well uh, for entry, uh, sorry, I should say for binding, and LAMB came up as a significant hit too. And this is not unusual. Some phages and other viruses have co-receptors. They bind to more than one thing on the cell surface. It, I would say, uh, go read the paper if you wanna learn more about some of these hits here that we find to be non-significant because they are core genes that are important for uh, disruption of ordinary cell functionality, bacterial functionality, and they're sort of false hits. But the point is we can navigate through the data, find what should be uh, indicating uh, receptors that phages use for their binding. And we also talk in this paper about additional work that could be done in the laboratory to confirm it. So the point here is you've got a high throughput way of finding cellular receptors. And you can also see this other work in the literature that's coming up where people are trying to solve the problem, but in different ways. So um, I'll now take you through a cartoon that reminds you a bit of what I've said so far. And that trade-offs, if you can demonstrate that they exist, that this should benefit phage therapy. We have a paper that should be published soon in Current Biology. It might've actually appeared earlier this week. And here we have a cartoon that summarizes several examples. I walked you through the example of uh, this first one on the left where a phage is entering the cell through a protein or uh, an important protein that's governing how antibiotics are moved out of the cell. So as the cells, as the bacterial population gains resistance to the phage, it becomes vulnerable to antibiotics. And I also gave you the capsule example, uh, the gaining of phage resistance leads to the, uh, in this case, the easier ability for the antibiotic to enter through the cell. And this one, I'll say a bit more about LPS because this is often used by phages as a receptor or a co-receptor. So LPS is interesting, it's all around the cell, and I often describe it to audiences as like a, a forest growing up from the surface of the cell and the outer portion of the LPS could be viewed as a canopy of that forest. So if a phage is coming in and trying to bind to that cell at a certain depth of the canopy, it will do so, and it will also select for the bacterial population to trim down the canopy or to make that uh, more shallow. And it turns out that that could provide an easier route for antibiotics to enter the cell. So you have this also ability of phages to exert selection pressure by utilizing LPS for binding and to make a bacterial po population more vulnerable to antibiotics. So I'll give you two examples. One is in E. coli and how we're able to measure the trade-off um, for a phage that we discovered in nature, U136b, and how it kills E. coli by interacting with Toll-C efflux pumps, and it selects for the uh, reduction in antibiotic resistance in the system. So efflux pumps do lots of things. You can see some of their functions here, but I'm, function I'm um, highlighting a lot of their contribution to antibiotic resistance, as I said earlier. If one plots how efficient is a phage in growing on bacteria, that's all you really have to know about this y-axis, across uh, several challenge strains of bacteria that have individual genes knocked out. So this can tell us that if, for this one phage, if we remove toll C as a possibility in this bacterium for making the outermost protein of efflux pumps, 
Here, there is just an undetectable ability for the phage to grow at all, whereas other knockouts, they grow just fine. So this screams at us, oh yes, Tol C is essential, and it is probably the only thing necessary um, for this phage to bind to the cell. There'll be more on that in a moment, though, because it's not the only thing that's necessary. For Tol C, one can then look further. What kind of growth do the bacteria show in a benign environment, no antibiotic presence, so this is zero uh, tetracycline, so the dilution series for this wild type bacterium, a Tulsi knockout bacterium, and a spontaneous phage resistant mutant to this phage that I just described, U136B, they all grow the same. In a tetracycline environment, you get a different outcome. So the wild type bacteria grow just fine because they have functioning efflux pumps. The Tulsi knockouts fail to grow and that's expected. And we're also seeing this for the phage resistant mutants. So that's confirming that the phage killed the bacteria while exerting selection pressure for at least um, obtainable mutants to suffer antibiotic sensitivity. So worse growth in the presence of antibiotic well, relative to the wild type. So the plot thickens in the system because this phage can not only bind to Tol C, it also binds to a portion of LPS. Here's a side view of LPS with the lower portion of the diagram as the cell surface. So here, as I illustrated or talked about earlier, there can be a middle portion of LPS that's important for phage binding. And that's certainly the case for this phage. So if you knock out certain of these RFA genes that are relevant to this depth of the LPS, this is a failure for the phage to properly bind and kill the cells. Well, guess what? As you obtain phage resistant mutants that avoid the phage attack problem, by changing their LPS, it makes them sensitive to a different antibiotic, colistin. So now you've got the trade-off being exerted by this phage in two different ways. It can drive the bacteria to be more sensitive to tetracycline through Tol C mutations, or more sensitive to colistin due to these LPS mutations. If one does a classic fluctuation experiment where we obtain very many spontaneous mutants, we can look at this a little more generally. So here, first focus on the efflux pump mutations to resist this phage attack. The ancestral MIC, or minimum amount of that drug needed to kill the bacteria, is shown here. Um, and a lot of these spontaneous mutants go in what I would say is the preferred direction, where they gain resistance to the phage and they become sensitive to antibiotic. Unfortunately, that's not the case for all of them. Some of them gain resistance to the phage and they actually increase in their resistance to the antibiotic. Certainly not something we would like to have happen. That's called a trade up, where two traits are being improved at the same time. LPS mutations give us a better average outcome. Again, the ancestral MIC here is at the far end of the x-axis. And by and large, all these phage resistant mutants that have changed LPS, they become either the same, they maintain the same amount of uh, resistance to, to, to colistin in this case, or they become more sensitive to colistin. So the punchline here is that you can get a range of possibilities, and this is just the way biology works. Biology is messy and complicated. But we thought, well, okay, let's look at actually the growth the debilitation of these mutants in a standard non-antibiotic environment if they carry around these mutations relative to wild type. So if you look at bacterial density over time, in a microplate reader or an automated spectrophotometer experiment, the solid line, black line, is the growth of the wild type bacteria. And you'll see that the spontaneous Tol C mutants don't suffer a very big fitness cost. When they gain resistance to the phage, they grow pretty much the same as the wild type. Whereas the LPS mutants have a big problem. They can gain resistance to the phage, but it causes them to be pretty growth debilitated relative to the wild type. So the point in showing you these data are to move to the next experiment, where if you do bacteriophage co-evolution in the laboratory, and you just let this run so that bacteria have to deal with the phage problem and gain resistance, based on the data I'm showing you here for spontaneous mutants, I would predict that the Tol C mutations are going to be the more successful ones if you just let co-evolution occur. Why is that? It's because they're going to be competitively superior on average to the LPS mutants, and therefore they'll be more successful in solving the problem and maintaining strong competition against the wild type bacterium and more easily capable of displacing it. 
And that's exactly what we saw in this paper that we published earlier this year. So first in red over evolutionary time, these are lineages of the bacteria where the phage is absent. But in blue, these are lineages where the phage was present. And we can track in this case, the tetracycline resistance of this population. And you'll see that in most cases, it declines over time. Beyond what I'm showing you in this one slide, but you can look at the paper for details, this means that indeed the TOLC mutations were on average more successful at solving the phage problem and showing up in these phage bacteria coevolution experiments. And uh, that's a nice uh, kind of synergy between what we see through the growth experiments on the right and the predicted outcome for the coevolution experiments, uh, I should say, on the right. I, I think I misspoke about uh, the growth curves are on the left. All right, so that was an example of how a naturally occurring phage can select. Um, most of the time, but not all the time, for reduced antibiotic resistance and target bacteria. Now I'll give you another example where we want to toggle virulence instead of antibiotic resistance. So here is a phage that binds to a pilus of P. originosa, and this pilus is important for many things for these bacteria, but it's linked up in a gene network to the production of a pretty nasty chemical called pyocyanin that has toxic effects. So during a P. originosa infection, this can cause tissue inflammation in a human and oxidative stress. It has a very characteristic bright green color when you grow bacteria that are capable of making pyocyanin. You see this in the laboratory on the left, whereas a mutant that is incapable of, of making pyocyanin um, doesn't make that chemical colored green. So uh, these pili are essentially a target for the bacteria to bind, uh, for the phage to bind to the bacteria. And they'll kill the bacteria, and they'll also select for the bacteria to lose or alter these pili, making them incapable of making the pyocyanin chemical, and therefore they're gonna be less virulent. And I'm showing you a picture here of a biofilm because loss of these pili also uh, would be difficult for the bacteria to form these tight, rigid structures that are very impermeable to antibiotics and other drugs uh, as biofilms. These form in the human body for some infections. So these unpublished data, I'll quickly go through this. This bar graph is showing you the relative pyosan in production for bacteria when they're exposed to different treatments. So if you take P. originosa and expose it to Cipro, if it's resistant to that antibiotic, it actually can make the problem worse for pyosan in production. And it'll go above the baseline level here of one. But jump over here to erythromycin. This could be given to patients to calm the inflammation process down and reduce pyosinin production effects, but it wouldn't necessarily kill the bacteria. And what we found here on the far right is a phage that does both. It kills the bacteria and it selects for the remaining mutants in the population to show much reduced pyosinin production. So that's a good outcome and uh, that gives us confidence to look at this further. And another example of the kind of experiments that we do that are really uh, large numbers of replicates and studied strains. In this case, I'm showing you a bit of an analysis where we took susceptible bacteria that are killed by these type 4 pilus targeting phages, and these are mutants, and we would like to know where in the bacterial genome is the solution to this problem occurring? You know, where is the debilitated um, pyocyanin production occurring? So for these very many mutants across the top and genes that were hits in the SNP analysis on the right, the red arrow is showing you in that nearly all of the cases, CHPA was a gene that was mutated. And this makes perfect sense because this is a chemosensory system regulator in the bacteria. It regulates type 4 pilus function. And uh, now that I show you a diagram that you can't read the details, for these very many whole genome sequenced mutants of P. originosa, you can see this yellow line extending almost all the way across. And that means CHPA is a very guaranteed target hit in the system as something that's altered through genetics to solve the phage uh, problem. And these are the kinds of details we would like to know to make uh, evolutionary predictions. So one bit of bad news before I show you the clinical evidence to complete this cartoon from our current biology paper that I believe is now out, trade ups are possible. So if you have, for example, phage and antibiotics entering a cell through the same porin, then resistance to the phage also gives the bacteria resistance to an antibiotic. And that wouldn't be so good for phage therapy. Unfortunately, that is the consequence, but it's important to know this. Um, 
for, for certain systems. So I'll give you a quick example here for phages T6 and a naturally occurring phage U115 that infect E. coli. If you throw at E. coli, either of these phages or this antibiotic albicidin, the problem is that all of these antimicrobials enter the bacteria in the same way, to so the same porin, TSX. And what it shows is that uh, these pie charts illustrate that it doesn't matter which of these antibacterials you use, the bacteria have very many ways of gaining resistance to them through this changes in TSX, and it gives them complete cross resistance to all of them. And that's not so great, as I said earlier. However, it's good to know these details and to understand the potential for antibiotics and phages to interact in a not so good way as you move phase therapy forward. It's good to know what the vulnerabilities are for this uh, approach. So let me finish by talking about the clinical evidence that we have, and uh, this is increasingly abundant in our laboratory and others. So a quick reminder of that, we're doing phage discovery, characterization, and ultimately treatment that at this point in our lab and uh, other efforts around the USA and around the world, a lot of this is personalized medicine. So uh, the ambition of creating phages as commercially useful standalone drugs, this has to be shown in a clinical trial. And we have the resources now to do our first clinical trial. I'll talk about that uh, at the end. But uh, just a few references here, including this book, The Perfect Predator, some of the recent successes for personalized treatment as phage therapy as an alternative to chemical antibiotics. This stuff is happening, and it's happening in earnest. Our first case that we did was in 2016. This was an elderly man who had an aortic arch replacement. So these artificial surfaces in the human body are increasingly common with surgery, but it can make a great substrate for bacteria to come in and cause a chronic infection. And that's exactly what this man suffered as a P. originosa infection that was chronic and it could not be treated with antibiotics. And he was too old to go through the surgery again to remove the infested portion of his heart and put a new artificial portion in. So we use this phage plus an ordinarily useless antibiotic and through synergy, the phage killed the bacteria. It enriched for the drug sensitive population of that bacteria to flourish, making it vulnerable to that antibiotic. And we were able to treat his infection in a single dose. And he went back to work in, the New, Haven, uh, in New Haven as an ophthalmologist. So our uh, success and others, it prompted the Scientific American article last year. And it's, a, it's compelling to think whether phage therapy in the Western world is now here to, to stay but I think we need more successes and we certainly need a lot more research. We've been trying to do our best to treat chronic infections. Here's a table that is not even complete. You know, every time I show this table, I could add one more line to the bottom of it, but eventually I'll run out of room. Um, in the case of the majority of these individuals, they have lung problems. Some of them are born with lung problems. If they have this genetic disease, cystic fibrosis, it causes widening of the airways in the lungs and overproduction of mucus, making these terrific substrates for bacteria to come in, cause an infection, and increasingly those bacteria are multi-drug resistant. Same problem occurs for an even larger patient community, non-CF bronchiectasis and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So in all those categories, but as you'll see here, mostly CF in this table, we've treated mostly Pseudomonas aeruginosa, occasionally a chromobacter, and we've done it successfully, either removing the infection entirely uh, but that's hard to do in some of these patients who are in very bad shape and they might have just a lung structure that is constantly seeing bacterial infections. And our idea here, our approach is trying to remove the most offensive pathogen uh, and convert the remaining bacterial pathogen. That's something that could be treated with ordinary uh, antibiotics or something else, but this is the difficulty and yet the successes of what we're doing. Uh, a few more data shown here for the clinical evidence. As I said earlier, these patients largely inhale through nebulizer, but they can also give us sputum samples over time. And we can look at the sputum for prephage versus postphage and find that their lung function improvement increases. That's great. Also, their bacterial load goes down. That's great as well. And for many of the antibiotics, when we're predicting that antibiotic resistance should be reverted to sensitivity, I'm showing you just a snapshot across several patients here that this might not always be a significant change. In many cases it is, it's going always in the right direction, either remaining constant or decreasing in antibiotic resistance. So the inflammatory molecule reduction would be uh, related to that virulence targeting phage I showed you earlier. 
So if the type 4 pili are being targeted as a binding site by these phage, I said earlier, pyocyanin is the thing that ends up being reduced over time for the bacteria to produce this. And you can see these green cultures from early sputum samples of the clones of bacteria changing to these more clear-like uh, samples because the inability to make the pyocyanin occurs over time. And that's shown in this graph. So for several strains taken from uh, time point one, four, et cetera, from a single patient, you can see the ability of their bacteria that are infecting them to decline in the ability to make pyocyanin. And that's excellent for this reason. If you then take all those clones, that grow them up in the laboratory, and in their supernatant, you can then take that supernatant and put it on tissue culture cells that are derived from human cells and see whether the interaction of those cells with the supernatant proves to you that the inflammatory process is reduced, that the inflammatory markers are going in the right direction, indicating that those bacteria still might be in the patient, but they're not causing the oxidative stress and the inflammation. And this was true for EGF, IL-8, and IL-6 in this unpublished data set as inflammatory markers. So a lot of what we're doing is evolutionary prediction, which I know very many of you in the audience are involved in some aspect of evolvability or evolutionary prediction. This is a terrifically difficult thing to prove to yourself that the in vitro data should match the patient outcome, because a lot of what we're dealing with for patient therapy is a black box. So I could give you an entire, another hour on the many things that I believe need to be studied next. Interactions of phages with human cells, so they may not be able to replicate in your cells, but it is possible for your cells to engulf phages and even to mount a bit of an interferon response. So we would like to know uh, in a more detailed way about those interactions when we're deploying phages in therapy. And the list goes on. Uh, Phage-phage interactions with either prophages that are in the target bacteria or phages that are part of your natural virome. Changes in the bacterial traits, aside from the ones that we're predicting, should be affected through trade-offs. Non-target bacterial pathogens that might be in the system as well, as you remove one pathogen, could you make the problem worse from a sort of ecological release standpoint, that the other pathogen can move into that space and flourish because you're removing a pathogen that happens to be out-competing it, but is causing the patient harm. Other non-target pathogens that are not even bacteria, viruses and fungi, could be benefited uh, through this way. Um, and just any general interactions with the resident microbiome are important to know. So what we try to do in my lab and at the company Felix Biotechnology, I pretty much spent most of my talking about P. originosa, it's a ton today, talking about P. originosa as a target where we're discovering phages that attack and exert trade-offs. I would say I'd give you a lot of preclinical data because the gold standard for clinical data would come from a clinical trial. We're going to do that soon. But waiting in the wings are very many systems that I didn't have time to talk about today for this project. Staph aureus, Acromobacter, Klebsiella, et cetera. So these are all bacterial pathogens that we're trying to take the same approach and make some headway. Uh, this wouldn't happen unless the US FDA approved what we were doing. We are very delighted to uh, get their approval for an upcoming clinical trial at our Yale New Haven Hospital to look at the ability of phages to protect the CF lung, the cystic fibrosis lung, and healthy volunteers. We teach this technology and the approach to students at Yale through a CURE course, a course-based undergraduate research uh, experience, and uh, that has been, uh, actually mostly my postdocs have been leading the charge for that, including most recently Dr. Alita Burmeister shown here with one of the students in the course. So this is terrifically fun to teach this technology, especially to incoming students who've never had a scientific experience before, and this gives them a lot of confidence moving forward that they can do research on systems that are important for basic research as well as applied goals. Workshops on developing phages for therapy. We're doing these uh, overseas, especially in countries where, look, drugs are expensive and phages may not be the way to always um, uh, supplant or replace expensive other approaches, but they could be viable ways of doing this in places where it's economically affordable to do the approach safely and effectively. So we've been doing workshops on this in East and West Africa, for example, especially with Toby Nagel, who runs Phages for Global Health, uh, Dr. Martha Clokey, who's at University of Leicester in the UK. And in this particular picture with the participants, again, this is Ben Chan, a research scientist in my group, as well as my uh, one of my graduate students, Katie Corkwright. So the last thing I'll say is that the next steps involve 
fields other than biomedicine. And if you had asked me three years ago, what would I be working on? Uh, I didn't know it was possible to make such headway such you know, so quickly in humans. And I thought we would be working in say agricultural systems or veterinary systems, but these are systems that suffer with antibiotic resistance problems as well. So a quick example from an unpublished paper for which I actually had nothing to do with this, but some folks in my lab are co-authors on this paper. A loggerhead sea turtle at a Florida aquarium had a chronic bacterial infection that was multi-drug resistant. And this unpublished picture is showing over the course of before phage therapy to the end. In the middle here, if you are more of a herpetologist than I am, you could uh, understand the details of this hard shell and soft tissue infection in this animal. It was killing it. It wouldn't eat anymore. It was in very bad shape. But members of my group isolated phages that were able to kill these bacteria, and along with phages that were discovered at BYU, this was successfully done. So it's just a reminder that this can happen in lots of systems other than humans. I'll end by acknowledging uh, the folks in my lab group who've really done the work, um, either recently or in the past. I've had the pleasure of working with very many terrific scientists, uh, young and more established, and many of them are shown here on the right those individuals whose work I talked about today. And I'll also uh, thank the generous funders. And I think I better stop there to preserve any time for questions. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Paul. That was a very fascinating and interesting talk. And thank you. To see that you're also developing the applied side of the work and um, the success already with um, some phage therapy um, with the emergency emergency human treatment so yeah, that's really mm -hmm. fun yeah it's, it's, been, um, it's been pretty rewarding stuff to do yeah. fantastic um so we have some questions starting to come in from the audience so i'll sure. move straight on to them um okay. so the first question asks what happens when there are more players involved i.e more than one antibiotic or phage being applied right right i think that that is at the heart of a lot of basic research that should occur so on the side of if you're deploying phages as a group as a cocktail I think that that has some automatic benefits, sort of creating a more complex environment for the bacteria to navigate. But it just so happens, early work that I've done in my career, as well as others, you know, as soon as you bring any groups of viruses together, some complicated things can occur. They could be inside of the cell competing with one another. They could be evolving traits of their own that wouldn't occur if you deployed them as singletons to do their job. So I think mm. there's a lot of fantastic complexities that need to be examined. And you know, I'm not saying that cocktails can't work and that people are using them, but I, I love the approach of trying to use as few phages as possible, trying to use them in sequence. But a lot of the basic research is happening in my lab and in others to kind of examine the evolutionary outcomes when this occurs, as well as the ecological interactions. I hope that answers the question, I'm not sure it did. Yes, yeah, that's excellent. Um, I'm also quite curious, um, so you talked about in some cases when you're harnessing these evolutionary trade-offs and applying the phages to make the bacteria more sensitive to the antibiotics, mm -hmm. but in some cases you found that um, mm -hmm. it became more antibiotic resistance or not as sensitive. I was wondering what factors um, determine um, the cases where they do become more antibiotic resistance after the phage has been added. Right. So we, we actually, uh, as a reminder, a lot of what we're doing so far is we'll take a patient's bacterium that is known to be causing them harm. And in our laboratory, we will make sure that a phage match or multiple phage match is driving the trade-off on average in the right direction so that we know that when we deploy the phage or phages in sequence that we're gonna get that outcome. But of course we can't control what happens genotypically through spontaneous mutation. I, I guess I would contend, but you know, I can easily hand this over to the theorists, is this really benefits from a modeling approach. So I, I think the short way for me to say it is, even though you have this uncertainty over the genotype space that bacteria would navigate to solve the problem, and you may not even know mechanistically yet, you know, why these different uh, mutations have their different effects. But if the clear majority of the mutations fall in the right direction, I mean, that is what could allow you to move forward carefully to use the technology anyway, as you figure out these biological and genetic details later on. And that's, that's kind of a loaded statement. I get that. 
but um, I give you all kinds of reminders. I think chemotherapy, no, it's known to work because historically it works. And uh, I know enough oncologists that there's a lot of mysteries to chemotherapy. It's not like we've always figured out the details for therapeutic approaches, but we've moved forward with them because people need the help. So I, I think phage therapy is kind of in the same realm is that we know we can safely and effectively move forward, but there's this huge wake behind it of basic research that I hope is going to keep people busy for perhaps decades. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think having the two hands in hand is a really powerful approach to apply the evolutionary principles to uh, addressing some of these medical questions. Mm, sure. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Thank you. I was also curious whether you explore at all um, the effect of environments, whether it be the temperature or perhaps the nutrient environment on these interactions between the phages and the bacteria. Good one. That's a good question. A lot of our work before we really did this phage therapy stuff dealt with particle stability in phages and other viruses. And uh, there it's a reminder that environments can be harsh stressors for phages and viruses. So there could be ways that you deploy this therapy. A great, a great example would be if you have to take an oral suspension to treat a lower gastrointestinal infection problem, the phage has to navigate the low pH of the stomach. So some mm -hmm. phages would be naturally more resilient to that stressor and others not so much. So here, I suppose the way to finish my answer is you could evolve the phages so that they deal better with environmental problems that you think would be a liability. But uh, it kind of what I just said just goes hand in hand. If I'm deploying the therapies to somewhere in your body, and let's say the immediate bombardment of those particles with the target bacteria is not immediate. So th this is a complex issue from a dynamics predictive standpoint. What do I have to do to deploy enough phages or just to understand that system for it to work. And I will be the first one to attest that inhaling phages to have them reach the crevices deep in the lung where some of these chronic infections are occurring, I thought would fail utterly. And it has worked beautifully in our hands and others. So there is something that we are missing that fortunately goes in the right direction of the black box of the human body. But I'll just, in this long-winded reply, <laughs> you know, the dynamics of biofilm formation and disruption could be something that is an unknown benefit. So, you know, biofilms, cells leave biofilms, they be, become planktonic. And it's that point where they bombard with phages. So could you get sort of this kind of enhancing of your drug in the system by not destroying the biofilm readily, but just sort of building up in a way that we didn't anticipate to eventually reach the biofilms and interact with them and break them down. And I'm, I'm literally hand-waving because I don't know the answers to this, but I think it's also a, a cool possibility for three-dimensional models and population genetics and community ecology models to, to come into play. Mm, definitely, and sort of the complexity of the, the genotype by environment interactions, I guess, on a, I agree. On a large scale. Um, <laughs> I was curious, so a question going back to earlier on in your talk where you were talking about generalists versus specialists. Yes. Um, and I was and obviously um you showed various examples where you do actually get generalist pages, and so it's yes. not that they're always specialists. Mm -hmm. Is there some sort of um way of predicting predicting um, either the gen gen generality or spe specificity of the phages. Yeah, this, this is like a, uh, um, one of the holy grails of this work. So if you, I didn't talk about it too much, but as we do these big host range challenges and look for generalist genotypes of phages, in a way, could you take your data and hand it over to machine learning or AI and say, okay, Based on sequence alone, what do you think AI, you know, would be the case for this candidate phage that I'm going to hand you and you look at the sequence and you figure it out for me so I don't have to do all the hard work. And let's just say in the early um, attempt to do this, we're pretty far off from generating large enough data sets, but we're trying and others are trying to do this. So that would be highly cool. And it's hard to say any conversation to somebody for an hour before COVID comes into it. But, you know, this is kind of at the heart of virus emergence, which we've worked on as well. What, what do you need to know about a virus for its latent potential 
to enter into another host and be successful as an emergent mm. virus. And it's all related to the same thing. Viruses carry around remarkably little genetic information, and yet they have amazing transformative power for what they can do or to affect host systems. So the better that we can understand this at the sequence level would be awesome. My prediction is that we're very far from that, and we're gonna have to rely on genotype phenotype understanding and mapping and get those details first. Um, but we're trying. So I, I think your question is a, is a good one here, or whoever posed it, if it wasn't your question, Elizabeth. I <laughs> Thank you. It's really exciting and you really um, show what the possibilities are for developing this in so many different angles, not just the phage bacteria um, context, but also the whole idea of virus host shifts and um, in virus <laughs> ecology and evolution more generally. So It's all related. Yeah. yeah, I look forward to seeing what comes next. And oh, thank you. Um, I'm afraid that's all we have time for today uh, for questions. But thank you very much, Paul, once again, for your fascinating talk. Thank you for the opportunity and thanks to those who listened in. Appreciate their time and energy. Thank you. And before we go, just to remind everyone that next week, um, our talk will be presented by Professor Eric Svensson about bridging micro and macro evolution in an old insect order. So we hope that you can join us then, same time and same place. And in the meantime, check out our updates on Slack and our Twitter feed and spread the word about our seminars. Thanks for taking part and until next time, stay safe and see you again soon. Goodbye.